think it's one minute. Right? Uh, wait a minute. Okay, so I suspect the last few minutes of yesterday's lecture were too fast. So let me uh, so let me uh, go over this uh, giant Wilson loop business uh, one more time and just repeat the main ideas. So <clears throat> so the, cru the crucial thing is that okay, so there is something. Uh, that weighs order n square, which is uh, the n equal to 4 super Young Mills action, or equivalently the Wigner semicircle distribution, or equivalently the ADS5 times S5 background. Okay, so this is something which is fixed at this order in the uh, n counting. And then, okay, we inserted something that goes like order, sorry. First, let's go order one, which was the Wilson loop in the fundamental representation. And uh, correspondingly, we had, okay, we had this trace e to the 2 pi m in the path integral. And correspondingly, we had a, a f1 string, a fundamental string in the back, okay? So in particular, this fundamental string in the back, I haven't really emphasized this yesterday. I, I, meant, I said it a couple of times, but maybe I, I should really uh, emphasize this more, but the induced metric of this object, uh, if you compute it, is ADS2, okay? So there is a, there is a surface, which it's a minimal surface, which is, uh, it has a disk topology, it ends on the, on, the, on the circle, and it has ADS2 metric. Okay, but now, okay, we can ask, okay, what happens if we insert something heavier and uh, so the next thing that you can think of is something which scales like n. And uh, uh, in, the, in the gauge theory side would be with the loops with a representation which is either symmetric or anti-symmetric of SUN, where k is of order n. So we have uh, either uh, a row of k order n boxes for the symmetric representation, or we have a column with k order n boxes for the anti-symmetric representation. Okay, so in the matrix model point of view, this was the uh, 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 topic in, in one of the exercises, and you can think of having just an isolated point outside the Wigner semicircle distribution or having a missing point in the, in the, in the distribution in case of a symmetric anti-symmetric representation, okay? But anyway, so there is, again, some, uh, some other insertion of this matrix. And then in, in, the, in the background, we have either D3 or D5 brains. But the crucial point is that, so bo both of these things are probes. So both the string and the brains are probes that they do not change the background geometry, okay? <clears throat> and okay, so um, how we understand that the D3 identify brain 
uh, or how do we understand, for example, this ADS2 factor from a symmetry point of view? Well, simply from the fact that what we have, so as, as, a, as an operator, The Wilson, it's, the Wilson loop insertion is either a line or a circle. It's actually simpler to think about the line, although it doesn't change, the, 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 the result doesn't change if we consider a circle. It's just that the way the symmetries are realized is different. But let's think about the line. It's a line in, uh, in, uh, in R4 times one point on this S5 internal space, OK? So we have, uh, as I told you yesterday, SL2R times SO3 coming from this part. Sorry, SO3 times SO5 coming from this other part. So. Um, so we have ADS2 times S2 times S4. OK, so again, this is just the remnant of the conformal group, which is left unbroken by having a line, which has three generators. I can do three generators, three, three transformations along the line. I can translate along the line. I can do a dilatation along the line, and I can do a special conformal transformation along the line. So it's three generators, SL2R. Then around any point of the line, I've got a sphere, SO3. And then since I fix this uh, coupling to the scalars to be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, I break the SO6 R symmetry down to SO5, which explains this. And again, in terms of isometries of the background, I preserve this thing. And there are associated supersymmetries. Half of them, half of the supersymmetries of the background are, are preserved. And you can really write down even the supergroup if you want. It's this OSP 4 star 4. OK, so now <coughs> the, uh, the important point is um, so focusing on this um, higher representations is that we have an extra parameter in the game, which is this, uh, this k, the number of boxes in my young tableau. And so the natural question is, how do I see k holographically? So what, what, what does this become? And uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, um, so if you think about it, it's, uh, what, what, what happens is that uh, there's going to be some fluxes threading either VS2 or VS4, depending on which brain you consider. And this flux is going to tell you, is going to be quantized, and it's going to tell you how many boxes you're you are, you are putting in your representation, OK? So this is the computation I, I've done, uh, I've done the, other, the other day. OK, so uh, there is some, in the DBI action, there is some uh, uh, gauge field on the for volume of a brain. And uh, this gauge field, um, so I got pi mu nu, which is the conjugate momentum to this gauge field. And uh, if you do the computation, if you compare how the brain couples to the uh, B field and how a string compares to the B field, you discover that. Uh, the condition is this one. OK, so you discover that uh, where A and B are the, if you want, the ADS2 directions. OK, so the, the, the gauge field is, is turned on along the ADS2 direction. And uh, if you integrate the momentum, uh, on, on the sphere, so this would be a VS2 in the case of a D3 brain, or it would be the S4 in the case of a D5 brain, you get, you get precisely this information uh, about the number of boxes in the representation. Good. Okay, so now, 
uh, what we can do, we can actually do computations and we can check this from the, uh, so we can, we can check these uh, ideas, this derivation with uh, uh, the matrix model and localization. So for, let me start with the Dietry brain. I'm not going to do the full computation because it would take me too long, but I'm going to give you the gist of the argument. So we have the, the, Dietry, the, the, the tension, and then we get a four-dimensional volume. You got a determinant, mu nu, g mu nu, plus two pi over square root of lambda, f mu nu. So this, this is the DBI action, and then you have a, uh, the Zumino term, which is one over four factorial, epsilon mu nu lambda rho, C mu nu lambda rho. Okay, so this is the tension of a D3 brain. This is one of the tension of the fundamental string. And, uh, uh, Essentially, what you want to do, you want to find uh, uh, the solution. And uh, so, we, so we know what was, the, so, and think about the circle, because this is the one that we want to, I mean, which has a non-trivial expectation value that we can compare, interestingly, to the, to the matrix model. So this was, if you want, this was the, the minimal surface for the string. Now you can think that what's going to happen is that I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to have a, a cycle, this, S, this S2, which is going to be at any point of this minimal surface. So it's like this, this sheet of the string which is puffing up and is becoming fat. Okay, so this is why these this objects are called giant objects. And uh, it pinches back to, the, back to the boundary, so this becomes like, well, I cannot really draw in, in, uh, in more dimensions, but think of that this would be something like this, all around, all around the, the circle, okay? And it pinches off, so the, the, the cycle shrinks when you go to the boundary and you land again on the, on the, on the Wilson lobe. So, how do you get this solution? Well, this is uh, a, complicated, a more complicated problem than what we did for the string, but in the string, we, uh, we learned a trick. So uh, the way you do it, you, you, you first solve for the line, which is simple, and then uh, you do an inversion, and you get the circular uh, Wilson loop. So start with the line, and then uh, you have a line along, let's, let's call it the x direction. Then you have an ADS2 times S2 for volume. So this is along the x and z directions. No, you don't get the same answer in the expectation value because uh, when you evaluate the action, indeed, you get either one or something non-trivial. But if I want to find the solution, I, I, I can use this method, of course. Yes. OK, and then I got some sphere with radius r of z such that r at 0 is equal to 0. So the, 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 the the, the sphere shrinks. Okay, so okay, you can do this, this computation. I wrote down, I wrote down uh, some some more details. It's not very, it's not very. Uh, I mean, there's many many. I, ca I cannot really do it in real time, but so, okay. The important thing is that okay, there is a C4, which has this uh, form. Dr times the volume of S2, and then you have a gauge field which is 2 pi over square root of lambda fxz. 
And then you, okay, so if you do the computation, you discover that, it, uh, that there is a natural parameter, a natural combination of the parameters that appears, which is this kappa equal to square root of lambda k over 4n. So this is a parameter that controls your solution. Okay, so you find, you, you, you first find the, 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 the straight line. The straight line is simple, essentially the solution of the straight line is, uh, is this r equal to kappa times z, and this f is equal to i over z squared. So this is the solution for the line. It's very simple. So you, you see it's a, it's, a, it's a line with a sphere with a radius that grows like this linearly in the bulk. Anyway, so after you have the solution, you do that inversion that I was discussing yesterday for the string. You get your solution for the circle. You plug it in. You have, again, to be careful about boundary terms. So you have to add these Legend transforms. But after you do everything carefully, and so the, all the details are in this paper 05, 011, 09, you discover that uh, the action of the D3 is going to be minus 2n kappa 1 plus kappa squared plus arc sinh of kappa. OK, so it, it is, some, it is some, some, some result. And if you've done your exercise, you, you're going to find that this is precisely the answer from the matrix model in this, in this representation. OK, in this, yes. Yes, the <laughs> definition of a C4. Yeah, in which gauge? In which gauge you take the, this? Yeah, but so far, I mean, it's, not yet. it's not really been sorted out. But okay, you, so you can couple with a tree form that uh, acts like yeah. Sorry, but isn't it precisely that the difference between the line and the circle that the gauge transformation, the gauge transformation that is not what they find at the boundary, and that's what induces the anomaly in the expectation value? Uh, I don't know if it is related to the same, to the same thing. No, because if everything is deep invariant, then the actual action of the line and the circle should be the same. But all you no, all you no, did no. was do a coordinate transformation, right? When I'm not between the ambiguity between the circle and the line, even, it, the, the circle, even within the circle, in yeah. One case, in one case or the other, you cannot write the, the best middle term. Right. Yeah. So so here is written in a sense. Respecting all the symmetries and the more natural, the most natural yeah. choice that you can have, which is this essentially volume form. But yeah, so there, there, there could be some ambiguity. Okay, so um, anyway, so the the uh, the thing is that if you take now, so this is your result. Okay, so if you take kappa going to zero. So you find that uh, the expectation value of a symmetric representation goes like uh, k power, so the kth power of the result for a single fundamental string. So this would be this would be the result for a fundamental string to the power k. And uh, uh, so the, the, the interpretation of this uh, of this result is the following. So from the matrix model, you have this. So the trace of this insertion is 1 over k factorial. So the trace e to pi m to the k. So this is the term with the largest number of traces. plus the expectation value of some other term which has k minus 1 traces. OK, so something which has less, less, than, so less traces than this. OK, so, so this is essentially, as I was mentioning here, so this is the, the, the leading term uh, is, uh, the leading term in this limit is just adding k fundamental strings one on top of each other. But then when you go 
to higher kappa, which is higher k, so this is k, this parameter that I can control, I start deviating from this, uh, from this uh, situation in which I just have from coincident strings, if you want. And so the <coughs> terms with, uh, with less traces are becoming important, and they start combining uh, in, a, in a non trivial way. So, and this interpretation is, uh, so if you write down, this is actually n to the k, k factorial, w the fundamental to the power k, plus orders n k minus 1, if you include all the normalization and, and you're careful about normalization. So this is, you start seeing how increasing k, you start including non-planar corrections, one over n corrections, okay? So you have this extra parameter k that allows you to explore this these extra corrections. And so the, the statement is that this uh, action knows about all the one over n corrections in this, uh, in this particular combination kappa and, uh, and resums them, okay? So the complete, the com complete result is a resummation of lambda k squared over n to the end corrections. Good, so now um, I'm running a little bit late, so let me be fast for the, so the DeFi brain, you do the same thing, actually this is a simpler situation because you have a, an ADS2 times S4, where V ADS2 is in AS5, and V S4 is in V S5. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a simple situation, and I was, as I was mentioning yesterday, you see uh, that now you have uh, some polar angle on V S5, and this polar angle controls the location of V S4, so you can write d omega 5 as d theta squared, plus sine square of theta d omega 4 squared, of course. So, so you have this angle theta, which is some polar angle. And now this angle, angle theta is determined by, by this equation. So now you see that the important parameter that appears in the game is not this kappa, but it is this guy. It's just k over n. So there is no factor of square root of lambda. And you can understand this because in terms of just tension of D brain, so the, the D5 brain is heavier by a factor of square root of lambda of the, than the D3 brain. So you have, this, you have this particular combination, so K enters here, and so now you understand that, uh, okay, theta cannot be larger than pi, and otherwise you don't have a solution, it's, it's a polar angle. And so this implies, so theta less than pi implies that k has to be less or equal than n, which is consistent for an anti-symmetric representation. You cannot have more, than, more boxes than, than n. Okay. But anyway, so if, if you compute the on-shell action, and again, you, comp you compare it with the matrix model, you, you, you find agreement, and again, you have a resummation of these uh, powers. Finally, a very interesting situation, so, so let, let's... Maybe just to clarify, I used to know this, but I forgot. So that comes up just from computing the string chart by the definition that you gave. I mean, I guess you have to generalize it for the I did. K is some integral of. Uh, yeah, yeah, on the uh, on the sphere on the yeah. sp minus. So that's going to be one. an integral over the s four. Yes. And that that integral, the, the result of that integral is that condition there. Or, or, or yeah. Um, I mean, more or less. I'm not saying. More or less. So this is. Yeah, yeah. So. Right. And that integral is is zero for theta equal to zero. That's how you see that the charge, which is which you're saying is that the the, the yeah. brain cannot have charge more than n. Right? Yes. 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 Precisely. So uh, let's remind, uh, so we had the fundamental representation, we had, we had an F1, and then we go to the, to the symmetric representation, we have a D3 brain, then we go to the anti-symmetric representation, we have a D5 brain, so you have this situation here, 
this situation here. But of course now, and okay, so this was order one insertion, this was order n insertion, but then now it's natural to consider, okay, what happens if I got an order n square insertion? So for example, if I take, if I take a, a large young tableau, which has order n on this side, order n on this other side, of course now you don't have ADS5 cross S5 anymore because these weights in the same way as the background, so there is a back reaction and you create a different geometry. So these geometries are called bubbling geometries. And they are very nice, they are very, so I, I, I like them for various reasons. So, but um, let me tell you, so what is the bubbling geometry? So first of all, it's, this is a half EPS geometry because it corresponds to a half EPS operator. Asymptotically, ADS5 crosses five, but then when you go deep, well, when you go inside of a ADS5 times S5, it becomes something uh, complicated. And uh, however, it has, to re it has to preserve the same symmetries of the loop. So I can do an ansatz, which is ds squared. So it has to contain ADS2, it has to contain omega two, it has to contain omega four. Okay, so now we have two, four, eight. Uh, um, direction plus remaining two ones and then I got some, fi some fiber over this base. So I got F1 squared, F2 squared, F4 squared where this F1, F2, F4 are functions of sigma. So this sigma <coughs> is the um, upper half plane So how do you get this solution? You, you, essentially, you, you have to use killing, killing spinors. Uh, so uh, there is, a, uh, there is a, a very nice, powerful formalism developed by Gauntlet and other people and then used extensively by UCLA group like Docker, Gott Perle, and other people, Estes, in which they computed lots of bubbling geometries for lots of different symmetry groups. And uh, so, I mean, there is, there is an algorithm. It's a very complicated algorithm, but it's an algorithm. Um, and anyway, so what you, what you find is that, okay, you have this, this, this solution, and in order to have re a regular solution, you have to impose boundary conditions on the boundary of sigma. And there are essentially binary boundary conditions. You can have it as either zero, one, or one half, or minus one half for some fields. And so you can, you can essentially define, you can define intervals in this, uh, in this, uh, in this boundary of sigma. So for example, in this, in this, uh, uh, in this region in blue, you get that F4 goes to zero. The regions in white, you get that the F2 goes to zero. So now you can consider, for example, F, a sphere like the S4 vibrated over an interval connecting two blue regions, and this give, will give you an S5. You can consider the S2, fib, uh, the S2 vibrated along two regions in which the F2 goes to zero, you, you are going to give an S3. Anyway, so you have cycles popping up, and this is why it's called bubbling, it's like you have bubbles of uh, spheres in, 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 this, uh, in, this, in, this, in this game. Okay, and then you can solve everything. So th the whole metric is, uh, is uh, encoded in a, in a hyperelliptic curve. So you, you tell me, you give me, essentially you give me a distribution of uh, white and blue regions on this line and I can, I produce 
to you a, a half EPS solution which respects ADS2 times S2 times S4 and preserves half of a supersymmetry. Okay? So now, of course, the, 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 the question is okay, what is the relation? So, what is the relation between these cuts in this? Uh, so, in, between this, these blue regions and white regions and the Wilson loop that I'm sorting. And this is the picture that I tried to draw the other day in which you have uh, <clears throat> you have this Wilson loop that you write down as a, as, so this, this would be the representation that you write in this oblique way and then you project down these sides. Oh, okay, I'm missing something. And then, okay, this would be like the, I don't know if it is the blue regions or the other one is the blue regions. But anyway, there is a very precise mapping between, uh, between uh, so on the matrix model point of view, this would be a multi matrix model with multi cuts. And um, so you have very precise mapping between uh, the spectral curve, the resolvent that appears in the matrix model with these particular cuts, and the geometry with uh, cuts given, I mean, with, with these uh, boundary conditions given by those cuts. Okay, so that is a very, very precise formula. And you can think of it as a, an example of emergent geometry. So you have, a, you have an auxiliary structure, a matrix model, which has nothing to do with geometry, but it knows about uh, some half EPS geometry in, with ADS5 times S5 boundary conditions. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, okay, it's, I guess, it's the, isn't it the same? Yeah, it is, I think it is the same thing. So you have a, you have a big matrix M, but now you can, you can divide it in, into blocks. And uh, every block is non-diagonal, is non-diagonal, but after you, so you, you, every block gives rise to a different. I think it's called multi-matrix model or, or multi-cut. I think it's the same thing. Okay, so the size of the regions, the blue and the white regions, is completely determined by the, the tableau that you give. Yes. So you give me a tableau. And yeah. So I give you, I give you, I give you the tableau. I can compute the matrix model, and then I can compare it with the supergravity, with a solution that has precisely the same structure of cuts. Okay, good. So I think I'm more or less on time. So um, I, I want to do now more. So, okay, again, I, I like it a lot. I like this picture a lot because of this emergent geometry thing. So uh, this is a very, very, this is not just, you know, ADS5 cross S5. This is a very complicated geometry and uh, all the information about this geometry is encoded in, in a resolvent of a matrix model. So this is, it, this is interesting for me. Yes. In these cases of the complete symmetry, this is not a particular case here. It would be the case in which you have only one cut. So it's like having, it's like having just one, for example, just this line, and then you just project down this guy, and you have only one. Uh, okay, so, uh, well, you don't have a bubbling geometry in that case. In that case, you don't have a back reaction on the geometry. So, yeah, let me say, originally, uh, so we had large, large, of, uh, large edges of this young tableau in order, so you want this edge to be large in order to have a, like a thermodynamic many eigenvalues here so that you can have a continuum limit. And then you wanted this to be large so that the distance is large and they don't interfere much with each other, the interaction between, between these uh, distributions, it's, it's simpler. And, uh, and this is what we compare to supergravity. But then from the matrix model point of view, then Leo had a more recent paper in which they can solve this thing for generic edges. Okay. So now I'm going to briefly review some other contours, some other operators, um, which are all related to each other. And uh, 
can, can also be computed using localization. So this is going to be the extra, so time permitted. So uh, I'm going to do the extra. So more examples. So and for this part, I'm using I, I'm uh, I'm following a nice review by Zarembo, which is um, in this big review on localization. There is a chapter on on Wilson loops, and I'm using this. But okay, I have to say that many of these things have actually been done by Diego Correa, who is sitting here. Okay, so um, the first example that I'm going to consider is a wavy line. So this is no longer a supersymmetric operator because we know that the operators are either uh, lines or circles, unless I do something peculiar to the scalar. So now let, let's consider just a line and then consider some waviness associated to this line. So and let me parameterize this wa waviness. So I got the parameter s going along the thing. So I got the xi of s that tells me how this wavy line differs from the straight line. So for example, something like, so this parameterization. So I got the line along the four direction plus some waviness from some small deviation. And now I can consider the combined propagator. So remember, I, I'm going to write down the definition again. So this is delta a b g m l square pi square one half. Okay, so this is the combined propagator. Of course, it's no longer is no longer zero, but uh, it has this uh, this expression. OK, of course, I can, I can do much more if I don't tell you what xi is. But even so, at uh, small lambda, I can uh, compute, for example, for the fundamental representation, this, uh, this thing. And it becomes uh, 32 pi squared, integral between minus infinity and infinity, ds1, ds2, psi dot 1, minus psi dot 2 squared, ds1 minus ds2. OK, so I, I mean, at this point, I'm just doing this computation. And I'm doing this computation because I want to define what is the prefactor in front of this integral. So if you do this computation in, in QED, you are going to find um, Larmor's formula for, for the radiation, for the energy radiated by by, by an electron. So I'm, I'm going to define this prefactor as b over 2. And so this is, this is a bram strahlung function. Again, so if you compute it in QED, b would be equal to 2 alpha over 3 pi. So you, you have this Larmor, the Larmor formula for the energy of uh, radiated by, by an electron. OK, so this is something that we can consider, we can, we can define. And uh, this is the first example. Now I'm going to move to a second example, and then a third, and a fourth. And then we're going to see that they are all related to each other. So. <clears throat> So the second example is called cusp anomalous dimension. So now I'm considering, <clears throat> so I, I'm, again, I'm in Euclidean signature. And uh, I'm considering, so this would be a line. But at some point, I, I introduce a cusp. And this 
angle, I call it phi. So the line go, goes like this. So we know from uh, quantum field theory that if you compute, so usually in quantum field theory, you have a linear divergence in the Winslow loop. But we saw that this linear divergence disappeared once you consider the gauge field plus the, the, the scalars together. But uh, we know that if you consider a cusp uh, contour or a self-intersecting contour, you get on top of the linear divergence, you get the lo a log divergence. And uh, the log divergence survives supersymmetry, I mean, survives the coupling to the scalars. So you're, you're still going to get a linear div a log divergence. And so let's regularize it by introducing two cutoffs. So one is uh, L, which is an infrared cutoff, and epsilon, which is a UV cutoff. So you can think of like, okay, L is the cutoff at which the cusped line starts deviating from being a straight line. And epsilon, you can think of smoothing out, so smoothing out the, the, the angle, the, the sharp angle at a distance epsilon. So this is some epsilon here and some L here. Okay. Okay, so now <coughs> I can compute the, um, so let me, let me parameterize this, uh, this loop using the letter S before I reach the cusp and the letter T after the, the cusp. So I can uh, compute this at weak coupling and I got one plus lambda over eight pi squared an integral between zero and L ds dt, one minus cosine of phi, s squared plus t squared plus two st cosine of phi. So one plus lambda eight pi squared, phi, one minus cosine of phi, sine of phi, So this, this integral is going to give you a log divergence that is expected. And it actually contains uh, interesting physical information. So now we define this to be equal to some constant, L over epsilon, so gamma cusp, which depends on lambda and phi, okay? So in general, this Wilson loop, we can, with this cusp, we can write it down like this for any value of lambda. So at weak coupling, it would be this particular expression. In general, we introduce a function of lambda and phi. So we see in particular that uh, at weak coupling, this gamma cusp becomes lambda over eight pi squared phi tangent of phi over two plus orders lambda squared. So it, 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 we just computed it. So yes. Which one? Uh, yeah, so this goes here. So now you can do an analytic continuation. In which this phi becomes I theta, becomes an imaginary angle. And this would, would, would like be, it's like going to a Minkowski contour uh, uh, with a kick. So you get a particle which stays at the origin and suddenly gets kicked and it moves in a, in a theta direction. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, okay, so now gamma cusp lambda i theta, when theta goes to infinity, now you can take the limit of very large theta and uh, this is minus four theta f of lambda, and this f of lambda is called the cusp anomalous dimension, and 
we, you have now connections with uh, integrability uh, where you can compute this object uh, using integrability. Okay, so now if you take uh, phi going to zero, so you have a very small cusp angle. So you stay in the Euclidean case, you take phi equal to zero. <coughs> And uh, um, and then you, of course, you recover. You recover in the strictly phi equal to zero, zero limit. You recover that the Wilson line has trivial expectation value, and that gamma cusp at any value of lambda and zero is equal to zero. There is no log divergence, and you can think of it as a as a wavy line. Uh, okay, so this is, of course, a consistency check. And then you can think of this uh, wavy, uh, as this cusped contour as a, as a wavy line. With a deformation xi, xi dot of mu, which is uh, a step function. times phi times uh, a unit normal to the first segment. OK, so if you do that, then uh, you, you can compute the Bremsstrahlung function associated with this wavy line. And then you you um, you find that for small phi this becomes one plus beta phi squared log l over epsilon, and so you find that there is a connection between uh, the cusp gamma cusp. and the Bremsstrahlung function. So the Bremsstrahlung function that was introduced from waviness is actually connected to, to gamma cusp in the limit of small cusp. Actually, there is another uh, possibility that we haven't really considered. Namely, remember that we had the coupling to the gauge field, but also we have the coupling to the scalars. So if you want to have a geometric contour with a cusp in, uh, in, in, in space time, and a cusp parametrized by phi, but also you could have a cusp in the internal contour. So you remember it was a theta i. But let's say it was zero, one, zero, 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 right? But then you can consider, OK, since I'm allowing for cusps, I'm allowing for discontinuity, let's say that I've got one coupling to the scalar on this half line. And then after I jump, I couple to a different scalar. So this would be a cusp in the internal space. And you can also do that. And also there are expansions. You can introduce a, a dependence in this internal angle in gamma cusp. You can expand again, and this is, is very similar. You, you're going to have phi squared minus the, the internal angle squared. So there, there is a very similar structure. Okay. Good. So now we introduce Bremsstrahlung function gamma cusp. You have this. Now you can think about a QQ bar potential as a third object. So the QQ bar potential, you usually think of it as a rectangular contour, right? So this is how we learn it in quantum field theory. When we study lattice gauge theories, you study Wilson loops in quantum field theory, you think about a rectangular contour with a very long side and a very short side. And uh, so it doesn't seem like we are considering rectangular contours, but think of a, of a cusp 
actually as a quark, and uh, so think about a cusp that now is pretty, pretty big, and think of it as a quark and anti-quark being generated from this point and now propagating. Okay, so if you take phi, so this would be, so if you want this would be phi, right? So if you take phi going to pi, you have, you have essentially collinear, well in the limit phi going to pi, you have collinear quark and anti-quark pair. Okay, so now <clears throat> you, can, uh, you can compute this. So for example, the log So you can compute this, and, uh, and then you can introduce, uh, uh, yes, the log of w phi, let's say for particles in the fundamental representation, when phi goes to pi, you can introduce some function alpha of lambda, pi minus phi, log L over epsilon. And so if you compute it at weak coupling, this alpha of L, would be like lambda over 4 pi at weak coupling. And uh, it is actually also related to this, uh, to this, uh, <clears throat> and it is related, this is essentially the quark anti-quark potential, and it's also, it is also related to this gamma cusp. Okay, so you can, you can see that alpha of lambda in general is the limit for phi going to pi of pi minus phi gamma cusp lambda phi. Okay, so there is this uh, gamma cusp is very it's a very interesting function that packs lots of information about different interesting physical situations. So radiation, Bremsstrahlung, and uh, and quark anti quark potential. Okay. So you can compute this at weak coupling, but actually you can also compute this at strong coupling <coughs> because it's a simple surface. Okay, uh, probably I'm not going to give you all the details because no. Okay, so weak coupling is a trivial computation. You just essentially use the formulas I wrote before and you get this result. Uh, at strong coupling, essentially, okay, what, what do I have? I have? I've got this cusp like this. So this is the z direction. So this is, this is a cusp in the z equal to zero plane. Okay, now I got this infinite, uh, this, this wedge. And I have to compute a minimal surface associated to this wedge. And uh, I mean, you see how, how, how the minimal surface is going to be. It's going to be something, something like this, right? So it's uh, convenient to use polar coordinates, R and var phi. And uh, it's clear that this surface has, has, to, has to be self, it has to be invariant under rescalings, right? It has to be self-similar. So you have a um, uh, self-similar form. So the answer for this surface is going to be something like z equal to r, some embedding function u of var phi, right? So, you, you, so this, at, this is at the origin, right? And then you tell me, okay, you tell me at which distance you are from the origin. And then depending on phi, I can tell you how deep you are in the interior of the surface. So this is the parameterization. Okay, so you, you write down the Nambugoto action. You get square root of lambda over two pi, integral dr over r d var phi, one over u squared, one plus u squared plus u prime squared. So you solve it, there is some integral of motion. Uh, you have to understand, you have to, this, you have to compute what is the highest point in the surface. Of course, it's going to be the, the, it's going to be the, the point halfway in the, in the cusp, it's going to be the highest point, so this is your integration constant. Anyway, you can compute it and uh, 
So compute action on shell, subtract the divergence and everything, and then you get that gamma cusp is equal to some elliptic integral. So square root of lambda pi u0, square root of 2 plus u0 squared. So u0 is the uh, highest point. Yeah, I mean, it's this integration constant that comes from integrating over the highest point. Um, 2 plus u0 squared, some elliptic integral, minus 1 plus u0 squared, some other elliptic integral. Anyway, you can do that. <coughs> And, uh, uh, and okay, you can take the limits now. You can take various limits. <clears throat> so this is valid for any, for any, uh, for any phi. So remember phi, okay, phi was this angle that I got in the cusp, okay? And the phi was the polar angle. So if you take phi going to pi, which corresponds to u0 going to 0 limit, you get that alpha of lambda, it goes like 4 pi squared, square root of lambda, over gamma, Euler gamma 1 quarter, uh, gamma, uh, yeah, gamma to the quarter, to the 4 of 1 quarter, uh, at lambda equal to infinity. And uh, if you have done exercise number 5, of the problem set, you, you should have gotten this, this structure from, from computing. So this was the original papers by Maldasen and Su Young Ray and Yi. They compute, they compute this, uh, this uh, quark anti quark potential at strong coupling. But anyway, so you see that everything is related to this uh, gamma cusp. Gamma cusp, as I said, packs lots of information. then you can take the limit of phi goes to zero or u zero going to infinity. And then you see uh, that you get the Bremsstrahlung function and this is square root of lambda over four pi squared, again, for lambda equal to infinity. So this is a very nice, this is a very nice object to consider, this, this cusped uh, Wilson lines. Very good, so now, what is the relation of all this study with uh, localization and uh, supersymmetry? Because these are non-supersymmetric operators. Um, so, okay, should I really only hope that I can compute them in particular limits like I've done so far? And actually, as uh, Diego Correa and collaborators found out, actually there, is a, there, there are exact results that can be, can, can be obtained from localization for all these, uh, for, for these quantities. And uh, these exact, exact results have to do with the fourth example I want to talk about, which, which is this one quarter BPS latitude that I uh, introduced in the first lecture and then it was a uh, subject of an exercise. So the idea is that this B of lambda can be obtained from uh, uh, the quarter BPS latitude. And uh, so a quarter BPS latitude, let me write down explicitly what uh, the contour is going to be in uh, <clears throat> in the internal space. Okay, so you have a latitude. So there is, you remember, you have the sphere on the, uh, in R4. And then you have, uh, you have the S5 of R symmetry. Okay, so you have this latitude and then you have uh, a dual latitude on the sphere parameterized by this, uh, by this angle theta zero. Okay, so you have this angle. So uh, what is called T zero, theta zero here becomes theta zero here, I guess. Well, 
uh, this is something that we always have to double check 10 times. Uh, okay, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah, it's like this. It's the complementary angle. Uh, but I guess it's the other way around. Is sine, cosine. Uh, maybe, okay, maybe I want to write down cosine theta zero here and sine theta zero. No, no, I think it was right. Sorry. Okay. Anyway, so you can check that this is one quarter BPS uh, if you've done the exercise. And now, uh, the fact that it's one quarter BPS gives you something very nice that these Wilson loops can be computed by localization. And in fact, it is the same matrix model as the usual with so it's going to be a Gaussian matrix model. The only thing that changes if instead of adding lambda, you have to replace lambda to the to cosine square of theta zero. <coughs> so you can import all the results that you computed already for the half EPS circle to this case of these uh, loops on the S2. The only thing that Okay, so for the particular latitude, you have to do various replacements. For generic loops on VS2, you have to do another replacement, but it's, 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 very, it's very simple. Okay, so now you can compute this. Uh, this uh, um, as I said, you can, uh, you can import all the results that you had before. So in particular, we can compute exactly the expectation value of a latitude at an angle theta zero. And uh, for n going to infinity, this is cosine theta zero, some Bessel function square root of lambda cosine theta zero. OK? So it's, it's the same Bessel function. So now when theta zero goes to zero, so yeah, actually, yeah, it was, it was, it was the opposite, right? So this is theta zero. And this is theta zero, sorry about that. So when theta zero goes to zero, <coughs> you go back to the half BPS circle, okay? And you can see, so the latitude as a wavy deformation of the circle. And so now you can compute the Bremsstrahlung associated with it. So you, you can compute the expectation value of the circle minus the expectation value of the latitude normalized by the expectation value of the circle. And this is uh, if you expand it for small theta zero, this is going to give you minus one over two pi squared, a Bremsstrahlung function, theta zero squared plus dots, okay? So you see from this uh, analysis that uh, the Bremsstrahlung function can actually be computed exactly and is given by one over two pi, derivative with respect of lambda of the log of the expectation value of the circle. So this is square root of lambda, Bessel function two over four pi squared, Bessel function one. Okay, so this is valid for any lambda and n going to infinity. Okay, so there is a, there is a connection between these four operators. So a wavy operator, a wavy line, a cusped line, the quark antiquark potential line. <coughs> So anti-parallel lines and the latitude. And uh, there are very nice connections that also connect to integrability. So this is an arena where lots of computations can be done, lots of uh, insight can be obtained. Okay, so thanks.